I'm going to give a bit of a global perspective and uh, bring in elements of Nepal in the context of sustainable diets. I wanted to, to talk a bit about the global aspects of sustainable diets because we are in a globalized world, as we all know. Little social unrest situations affect the other side of the planet. I mean, Nepal doesn't sit in isolation. It's sandwiched between two massive countries or subcontinents um, that uh, very much are important in the uh, political uh, economy of Nepal. So I'm going to talk transitioning diets. Diets are, are, are going in different directions. And what are some of the implications of those transitioning diets? I'll talk about the implication of diets in the, in the Nepalese context. Um, then we'll talk about and this emerging idea of sustainable diets. What are sustainable diets? But what are also the challenges if we want to move more towards sustainable diets? And then I'll end with some ideas. So how are diets transitioning? Well, we're eating too much globally. The quality is not so good. It's not affordable or accessible, and it's not really sustainable. So I'm going to depress you all for about 25 minutes of my talk. Um, too much. We're consuming way too many calories around the world. And if you look at the tra tra trajectory over time, our calories are, are going up. And obviously, the United States, where I'm from, we consume a lot of food. Uh, the EU is right behind, followed by Brazil and China. So on average, a US person consumes about 3,500 calories a day. Nepal sits at about 2,600. Now, I'm going to caveat this data. This is consumption data coming from FAO stat. Consumption data from FAO stat means food supply. It's the food moving around the country. It's not actually what people are taking in. And there's a big data gap to be, to be filled in that area of what are people actually consuming. And Tufts is doing a lot of work in this area, as well as in, uh, Keith West in this project itself um, of Poshan. But this is just looking at the food supply data or the food balance sheets. Fruit and vegetable intake is low. Vegetable intake is low globally. We don't consume enough of those micronutrient sources. We consume a lot of sugar. We consume a lot of fat. We consume a lot of processed foods that are low in fiber. So we're moving towards this very kind of processed diet. Um, and you can see, again, the United States lights up. So don't be like us. Please don't move in our direction. Very hard to do. Um, and, and, and fruit and vegetable consumption is, is, is quite low uh, around the world. The diets aren't affordable, particularly for those in the poorest wealth quintiles. They consume um, an inadequate diet that is very costly, spending up to 60, 70 percent of their total income just to eat food. Um, in some places, people consume um, high quality diets and spend a lot on food by choice. Um, but in most places, people struggle to meet their basic cost of diet. And what our diet is moving towards this very unsustainable uh, trajectory. Why is that? Well, animal source foods is on the rise. There's a demand for animal source foods. Why? Well, they're tasty. It's, animal source foods taste good to a lot of people. Um, and if you look at the trajectory of how food has has moved and, and animal-based protein, we've seen this increase. There's an increased demand, particularly in places coming from like China. Um, and this has a huge environmental footprint, particularly beef, red meat, as well as dairy and poultry. And it's not just on greenhouse gas emissions. It's all also on land use. It's on water footprint, and, and we're really increasing the amount of land being used to raise cattle. And a lot of the grain that we're producing in the world is being used to feed cattle. So this is not a sustainable solution. Um, and it's, it's moving in the wrong direction on many fronts for the environment. So what are the implications of our choices? Well, I'm going to outline four things. There's health consequences, um, environmental consequences, social inequity, and ethical consequences. Um, diet is now the 
the lead cause of global disease burden in the world. Um, this is data coming out of, of that large project of the Global Disease Burden Project. Uh, this was data published in The Lancet showing that dietary risk uh, has the highest burden, and most of that burden in the world is now non-communicable diseases. So we've shifted from communicable diseases, maternal and child undernutrition, to now where most people, the morbidity and mortality sits with cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, very complicated, very burdened health system type diseases. And what kind of diets are these that are such high risk factors? Diets low in fruits, low in nuts and seeds, high in fat, high in sugar, high in salt, low in fiber, high in red meat and processed meat. There's this trend, it's the very, what we would call the Western or the American diet. And what you eat matters. What type of diet you have matters. This was a great paper that came out in Nature Magazine by David Tillman, who's an ecologist, actually. And he looked at different diets, the Mediterranean diet, which is often touted as being very healthy, um, lowers non-communicable disease risk of cancer, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease. And he compared that with a vegetarian and a pescatarian diet, a, a fish-rich diet, to the omnivorous diet, the typical Western diet. And he looked at risk reduction and found that most of these diets, compared to the Western diet, he saw a, 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 a reduced risk in diabetes, cancer, coronary mortality for the Mediterranean, the fish, rich diet, the pescatarian diet, and the vegetarian diet. So that makes sense. Um, the only one of interest that I think would interest a lot of the audience is that the vegetarian diet, the all-cause mortality, there was no reduced risk. And they don't really understand why that is. Um, and maybe some of you have read the news, the WHO came out with a press release that processed foods like bacon, um, prosciutto, which I like, I'm Italian, um, and grilled meats put you at higher risk for colorectal cancer. And here's a, on Time Magazine, some bacon with an X through it called the War on Delicious. Um, so people are pretty upset about this, that like their bacon in the morning, their swine. Humans aren't the only sufferers of this. The environment also suffers as well. Different diets show different types of environmental impacts. This is showing you in blue the average U.S. diet. Red is a 75% reduction in meat overall. And green is a 75% reduction in meat, but no beef, no red meat. And you can see that there's pretty dramatic decreases on land requirements, water, and greenhouse gas emissions. So it would be important for the world to maybe think about eating less red meat. Um, red meat, beef, is a big contributor to greenhouse gases. About 25% of all greenhouse gases globally are attributed to the raising and production of beef in the world. So it's significant. So while a lot of the climate change negotiations, COP21 in Paris, focused on transportation, really very little was focused on the agriculture sector. So the agriculture sector just plods on. Social inequities big social inequities of our diets. We know that in high and middle income countries and urban populations and in all income countries, meat and dairy consumption is rising. Maybe we don't need to eat so much. Where in low income settings, there is a need for animal source foods. There's nutrient requirements that a lot of you are very well aware of that meat or animal source foods can provide zinc and iron, and these are big nutrient gaps. So there's this inequity happening where those that don't need it are eating too much, and those that need it are eating too little, and this is a real big problem. Quality. Quality varies all over the world of our food supply. We put certain standards on international uh, uh, in international trade that doesn't allow for economic growth of countries, whereas um, we hold certain and we hold certain standards, whereas other countries don't. And there's a lot of inequity in our whole trade agreement around quality of diets and consequences of decisions. The most vulnerable and those living in low-income countries will suffer the most from our choices, 
what we choose to eat, how we choose to raise our animals, how we choose to produce our food. Those who are living in low-income countries are, will be incredibly vulnerable to climate change impacts and economic impacts. This is incredibly inequitable. Um, just an example showing you meat consumption. The US consumes huge amounts of meat, whereas in Nepal, you guys are consuming so much less. It's 30-fold less than the United States. It's incredible. Um, but we also know that, as I said earlier, there's big nutrient gaps in comp typical complementary foods, even with, with breast milk. This is showing you iron intake. So there's a nutrient gap to be, to be met for, for particularly growing children who are, who are developing not only in their bodies, but in their brains. And ethical consequences. This is a really loaded issue, and we're seeing more and more issues that involve moral obligation. How do we ensure autonomy, self-liberties? How do we ensure beneficence, that we're doing public good? How do we ensure non-maleficence, that we're doing no harm, and ensure justice is intact? These are the core principles of ethics, and when we think about the food system and the players within the food system, we're continually breaking these. So th I ask you the question, does man have a right to eat wrongly? I hope some of the data that I just showed you, you could argue no. What I decide to eat in the United States may impact the Nepalese farmer. We also have really big consequences that get into the realm of ethics. The intergenerational epigenetic arguments, this becomes an ethical question about what a woman chooses to do, her behavior when she's pregnant, and what would be the outcomes for that child when she's an adult. Deteriorate environmental stewardship. Who owns the environment? Who owns biodiversity? Animal welfare issues, big topic, very much integrated into our diets. And loss of food sovereignty. Food sovereignty sits in the Nepal constitution, which is incredible, but what does it really mean? So what are the implications for the Nepal context? I had a slide up here showing you the declines in stunting, which have been incredible, and I congratulate everyone in the room for making such huge progress on reducing stunting. Not many countries have been able to do it, and not as fast. And I think a lot of people are looking at places like Nepal, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and how you did it. But you're getting into that next phase where you still need to reduce those numbers. It's still high, and it's going to take more complex interactions with systems. It's going to involve deeper interventions, as Keith had, had talked about. Meanwhile, you have this rise in obesity. And I was looking at the Global Nutrition Report statistics for Nepal, and I had them up here. It's alarmingly high for a country with high stunting. So you've got this multiple burdens of malnutrition that you're facing, which is going to get very complicated if obesity continues to rise. And no country has been able to stop the rise in obesity. Not one country. People talk about South Korea. They talk about Japan. If you look at the statistics, it's rising. And this will be one of your biggest challenges. You, if, you, if any of you come to the United States, you'd be alarmed at the number of people who are obese. It's pretty shocking, and it's debilitating for a nation. Food. And this was a study looking at um, lactating women, looking at the diet, and this was another diet looking at, uh, at young children ages zero to five and looking over different seasons. And basically, you can't see it, but the, the majority of the diet is rice, right? It's rice. I like rice. It's good. But it's, it's monotonous, and, and in this study above, um, it contributed 60% of energy intake. Also, diets are costly. People can't afford their basic diet. The Nutrition Innovation Lab had a report that just came out, a, a paper that just came out on the cost of diets, looking at the different regions. But the diets are expensive, and people can't afford it. And what do you see in this picture? There's a lot of rice in that picture. There's also another interesting thing. Does anyone else see it? What's on the side of the plate? Cigarettes. 
big risk factor of non-communicable diseases. I love this picture. I saw it and I was like, this is perfect. The rice and the cigarettes, you're all set. Oh, here's the nutrition outcome, sorry. If you look at overweight, 21% of women are overweight, 14% of men, that's high. And disease burden is shifting. If you look just at the pink, the, the light pink bar, you have males that are 2000, year 2000 and then 2012. That light pink bar is the most significant jump. That's cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And that's become your number one uh, cause of mortality and morbidity now if you look at the WHO data. And the risk factors are pretty alarming too. If you look at the green, uh, that's raised blood pressure. So that's a risk factor of hypertension. You've got raised blood glucose, risk factor of diabetes, raised blood cholesterol, risk factor of cardiovascular disease. Um, particularly the raised uh, blood pressure is pretty high. So what are sustainable diets? Well, they're great in theory. They are meant to be healthy for ourselves and for the planet, economically viable, um, and socially, culturally appropriate. Sustainable diets, though, are very complex. We created a framework of what would constitute a sustainable diet. It involves health, sociocultural, environment, socioeconomical, and agriculture. It's really challenging to figure out what is a sustainable diet. Diets are complex, they're diverse, they're different depending on where you go. How do you ensure that, that you are being, eating healthy? while ensuring that there's environmental sustainability. This is a really challenging question. We think about the Mediterranean diet, very healthy. If you look at the environment of that, olive oil, the main staple of the Mediterranean diet, huge water footprint. So while it's healthy, there's an environmental trade-off. These are some of the questions that we have to start grappling with. But we have challenges, climate change, Huge issue that's looming amongst us. It's happening. It's everything change, not just climate change. And we're going to have to deal with it. The planet's going to get warmer, different places. It's going to be great to live in Canada. You can grow a lot of food, probably tropical food, by 2050. Other places are going to suffer. Climate change has direct relationships with natural disasters, including earthquakes and what they call the geological uncertainties, as you all know so well. We're worried about the severity of these natural disasters. Depletion of natural resources. Our agriculture system is becoming more uniform. If you look at Nepal, sitting here, what they had a large diversity of foods they were growing. But in the last 40 years, from 1960 to now 2010, they've merged into growing about 12 crops at the, at the most. So we're merging into having just a few dominant crops dominate our, our arable land on the planet. For example, cabbage. We used to have 544 varieties of cabbage. Now we have 20. I don't care because I don't like cabbage, but we do care because they have a lot of different nutritional diversity. They're important for climate change, risk uh, adversity, different varieties grow in different types of, of climates. This is alarming. This is our food supply dwindling. And if you look at Johan Rockström, Rock Home Resilience Center, he came up with something called the planetary boundaries. He came up with 12 of them. We've already surpassed the planetary boundary for biodiversity. We will never recover from that. This is a worry. Population growth, pressure, and urbanization. You all know this very well. Um, you have places like the Terai down here. The Terai, very population dense. Um, and your population's growing, and your urban centers will have to figure out a way to handle the population pressures. Social unrest. We know that food prices, crop failures can lead to social unrest. We saw this in the 2007-2008 food price spike that was due to crop failures around the world. We saw it again in 2010-2011, which some hypothesized led to the Arab Spring. Food is very much tied to social outcomes. Maybe you've heard the Bob Marley, a hungry man is an angry man, or an angry man is a hungry man. This is true. Um, we look at the food price index, which is in blue, and 
and uh, the spikes are food-related protests and riots. This is real, and it's an issue if we continue on this trend. And with that, with these food prices, are shocks to systems that dismantle food systems very quickly. You all experienced a massive earthquake, a devastating earthquake that really led to big issues around food security. What some of the achievements that you made in these hard to reach areas, rapidly a shock hit the system. They were cut off, diversity declined, 100% relying on food aid, these are big system shocks that lead to a lot of social unrest. I just put this, the UNDP Nepal Human Development Report. You've made incredible strides. Um, so it's not just that you've made strides on the nutrition front, but you've really made strides on the whole poverty front. Um, there's going to be future challenges, though, as I had pointed out. And you don't sit isolated. And diets and nutrition outcomes are going to be affected by global food policies, decisions made by other countries, trade and globalization. And what you do matters now in the SDGs as you formulate your country level sustainable development goal targets. It's going to be important to think about the global intricacy that you are now living in. The US is also going to be held accountable for the SDGs. We didn't we weren't held accountable for the MDGs, but every country now is accountable. And so we have to think, we often talk about nutrition and how it fits into all the other SDG goals, but we also have to think about how each country fits with each other in the SDGs. It matters now. We need better alignment of policies for more sustainable diets. Um, if you just look at this middle bar, this is showing you in green the dairy supply, the dairy supply in the world. How much dairy is being produced, moved, traded in the world. And then you look at the United States dietary guideline, what is recommended for each person, kilograms per capita per year. We would outstrip the entire global food supply for dairy, the United States would. So our dietary guidelines don't fit with our agriculture and environmental strategies at all. We did a very, this is, a, I know this is a disaster, right? This is a framework for sustainable diets in which we looked at the Nepal agriculture development strategy, the multi-sectoral nutrition plan, and the biodiversity strategy that recently came out. And we looked at whether or not it fit with these ideas of what we consider a sustainable diet. And if you look at just the top of, of these different frameworks, we found that the agriculture development strategy had the most actionable, not just mentioned sustainable diets or aspects of sustainable diets, but actionable items in their strategy, more than the, the multi-sectoral nutrition plan, which I found uh, pretty interesting. My second recommendation is more program sensitivity and system interactions. At minimum, we have to start thinking about health and food systems and how these interact. The Ebola situation was a perfect example of where a shock hit the health system and it completely dismantled the food system in places like Liberia, for example. So an example of where these systems really interact and a shock to the system will shock potentially both and, and, along with a lot more systems. So thinking about these interactions, and I want to focus just on two things. The food environment, which is part of the food system, and utilizing what's there. The food environment is where the consumer engages with the food system. It's their environment they live in. It's the market they go to. It's the school their daughter attends. It's the, the workplace where they get food. They then have to make a choice, an informed choice, hopefully, but at the end of the day, they make a choice based on taste, price. Usually health and nutrition is a lot further down. Environment is way further down. Convenience, all of these things come into play. The food environment is something we very rarely focus on. We talk about the food system, we talk about agriculture, what are people growing, how is it moving, is it getting to markets? But at the end of the day, the consumer goes to a market, even a farmer, most farmers, and they have to make a choice. And what is that choice? and what's there. And we're living in an environment that is very highly influenced by a lot of players, but mainly industry. Industry has an important role to play in improving nutrition and health of the country. 
a lot of you know the movement towards more processed foods. This is who you have to engage with if you're going to talk about the food system and you're going to talk about the food environment. We can talk that this is in the United States, it's everywhere, right? This is everywhere. And these are the kind of food environments people are exposed to. Here's a little girl, hopefully she's going to buy just the water, but probably the potato chips behind her. Here's a street market, fried foods, it's a very typical food environment. And lastly, remittances, an interesting platform of using what's there. How can you better use remittances from the out-migration, right, that are coming back into the country to improve nutrition and health? How can you link it to education programs? We did a systematic review recently of the effect of remittances on diets and nutrition, and it's really mixed. But often when you had an education program attached to it or a conditional type program attached to it, we saw improvements in health and nutrition. But there's very little information out there about remittances. So study it, understand it, understand the complex linkages, and publish it. And last is metrics. We need to embrace complexity. All of you youngsters, all of you young whippersnappers in the audience are dealing in a very complex environment. I presented that. It requires complex methods and metrics and ways of looking at these interactions. We can't just look at dietary diversity as an indicator. It's one of many. I loved, uh, I saw a really interesting presentation that Patrick Webb did a few years ago when he was showing the UNICEF causal framework for nutrition that has all the boxes. And he said, we need to focus on the arrows. How do you get from box one to box two? We need to focus on those arrows and the interactions and feedback loops of those. It's complex, it's messy, but as Keith said, it's interesting and it's your future. And I think those of you who are young are really great social networkers. Your minds are built differently than my mind. I'm very singular. You are all over the place. So I think you guys can do this kind of work. And thank you very much.